great. All right, so um, today I'm gonna talk to you about um, this kind of more recent stream of work uh, that I've been investigating on using diffusion asymptotics for designing sequential experiments. Uh, this is joint work with my colleague, Stefan Wagner. Um, I've probably given uh, this version of talk to some of you in the past uh, when the, the work was at a more preliminary stage. Obviously there will be some overlap but we've actually since gotten some newer results. So uh, I apologize for any overlap and I'll try to highlight uh, what's new here. Great. All right, so kind of the overarching principle that I wanna kind of highlight or our goal that we're targeting is to find good asymptotic objects. That'll be very useful for understanding sequential experiments. So what exactly are they? Well, sequential experiments, uh, such as the very well-known multi-arm bandit problem, essentially collect data by adapting your data collection action to past experiences and past data. Now, it's typically more effective compared to classical non-adaptive randomized experiments, uh, simply because the actions are now concentrated on more promising actions and then those are better not. However, on the flip side, adaptivity often leads to fairly intricate dependency patterns uh, and, and hard to analyze kind of the dynamics. And that's sort of a, uh, a, a trade-off that we have to deal with. Um, this field of adaptive experiments has since really sparked a lot of work and a really rich body of literature. However, I would say at a very high level, probably fair to say existing work largely focuses on domains with automated adaptive learning, such as uh, kind of pricing or uh, recommendation systems and that really require robust worst case performance guarantees. Worst case in the sense that the algorithm should do well uh, under all sorts of combinations of parameters. And so that the algorithm can actually run pretty well with little human oversight. But more recently, I would say a lot of higher high stake applications are emerging where humans are actually closely monitoring and fine tuning an experiment. Uh, think of public health interventions or infectious disease testing. Now, in these examples, I would argue that's actually very valuable to be able to move past worst case guarantees. It specifically be nice to have a refined instance specific understanding of the stochastic behavior of a particular types of adaptive experiments. And that's exactly the goal for this talk. So in this talk, we'll be interested in establishing a diffusion asymptotic framework so that we can have a fairly unified treatment of a family of sequential experiments and including several popular algorithms. And within this realm, we're interested in getting a new tool for getting instance specific regret and sample path characterizations. It's like a, think of a, as a somewhat of a microscope. Maybe you can let us uh, describe the process happening with a finer scale and getting more refined understandings. Now to illustrate how to use this tool, we're gonna look at the special case of uh, Thompson sampling. Uh, as many of you know, this is a very popular um, uh, family of policies and some of the earlier theoretical analysis was actually uh, pioneered by Shifra who just gave a talk in this uh, um, uh, seminar series. Okay, so that's the rough plan for today's talk. Okay, all right, so jumping right in here, um, let me first start by defining what's the class of commercial experiments we're looking at and along with the definition for, for diffusion scaling. Okay, so let me introduce a fairly standard framework of stochastic multi-arm bandit problem. So here we have a sequence of decision points, that's discrete time uh, from one through n, and n being the horizon or sample size of the experiment. At every step i, an agent chooses an action a from a finite set, then observe a reward yi, now we're gonna assume that yi is drawn from distribution that only depends on the action that you chose and that the mean of the kth action is denoted by mu k. And importantly, the realization yi is otherwise independent of everything else in the system, only depends on the action that you chose. And the action ai being in a adaptive experiment can depend on historic uh, observations. Right, so a standard goal in this type of problem is for the agent to kind of figure out over time which action has the highest mean reward and to achieve the highest expected payoff over uh, the entire course of n uh, samples. So one way to measure how successful you are doing this is to minimize this notion of expected regret. Now by expected regret, I would define that as 
the difference between your expected payoff relative to the simple, uh, the single best action in hindsight. So here, Rn is n times the supremum over all the mean rewards. That is the kind of ideal situation, how much you can hope to get, minus expected value of your actual performance, which is mu sub AI. Okay, so that's a standard definition of regret in a stochastic multi arm bending problem. All right, so this kind of uh, defines the, the, the realm of, that we're operating in. So now let me introduce the asymptotic regime uh, that we're going to go into. By the way, by asymptotic, we're doing so because oftentimes that brings a bit of a clarity and insights uh, on the type of system. And for this audience, I'm sure that's a fairly familiar concept. So we're going to look at a sequence of systems indexed by the sample size n. And for each n, consider a K-armed sequential experiment with sample size N and reward distribution K, uh, P sub K N. So here I have an explicit dependency on N because eventually the reward distribution is gonna evolve as I look at different uh, sample sizes. And specifically as N grows, we will let the reward distribution evolve in such a way that preserve the difficulty learning task. So the task does not get easier as a sample size grows to infinity. All right, so here's the diffusion scaling. So we're gonna assume that the reward distribution satisfies the following. The mean reward in the kth system will scale at the rate of mu k, a constant, divided by square root of n. Okay, so the mean rewards kind of goes down at, at, at rate one of root n. And the variance of the reward or the noise actually stays constant. It does not scale uh, as n grows. Okay. And I, I'm also gonna assume that the reward distributions will admit a bounded fourth moment for technical reasons of establishing diffusion approximation. Now, another thing to highlight that this actually assumed that your rewards start to kind of squeeze uh, towards zero, and that's not necessarily needed. Uh, you can also establish the same theorem by assuming that the rewards kind of converge uh, to a, a fixed value that's not necessarily zero. Um, namely, the result should hold uh, in a way that's invariant to translation. Okay. The point is all the rewards are starting to become very similar to each other. Great. All right, so this particular diffusion scaling that we're considering are inspired by a few things. And then first of all, actually bears a lot of resemblance um, from heavy traffic diffusion limits and heavy traffic analysis in queuing theory so castle control, as well as this notion of a local asymptotic normality in, in statistics. Okay, so it borrows a lot of ideas there. By the way, um, just as a general thing, I apologize that I'm skipping a lot of specific references for space reason in this talk, but I'm attaching a link to the, to the print print where all the references are given. Now, an important feature for this type of scaling is that as n grows to infinity, my belief as a decision maker about the truth on the mean rewards, even after a large number of samples, they do not converge. They remain a non-trivial distribution. Okay? So they remain genuinely uncertain, even after the entire experiment. And such settings are quite important applications where sample size is fairly moderate compared to the signal. For example, you might be in a clinical trial where the treatment effect is very weak, um, and you still want to do great things. You don't want to incur unnecessary costs and you want to minimize kind of a negative impact to the patients. All right. All right, so that was how we consider the scaling of the system. So now let's talk about the family of policies and algorithms uh, we're going to be analyzing. So now let me define a notion of sequentially randomized mock-up experiments. And this really kind of restrict the family of things we're looking at. To start, let me define two state variables for any kind of um, uh, policy. First, frequency. So QKI will be the number of times you've chosen action or arm K by time I. So it's a counting uh, process. And reward tracks how much reward you have accumulated from those arms. So SKI um, is the cumulated reward from action K. Uh, by time i. Now, you might say that these two are actually pretty fundamental quantities. Uh, and indeed, we're going to assume that the policy we're looking at in each round generates an action 
And the probability distribution for the action only depends on the vector of frequencies and the vector of rewards up until this point. So I'm gonna define pi ki as a sampling probability of choosing action k at time i, and assume that it's generated by some function psi that only depends on um, the cumulated frequencies and cumulated rewards up to this point. So psi going forward, I will call it the sampling function. And to note that this definition is actually surprisingly broad. For instance, it can capture essentially arbitrary, um, arbitrary time dependencies um, because it also knows the time so far, i. Um, if you add up all the coordinates of q, it will just be equal to time i. Now, finally, this is very, very useful for us because under this definition, this type of policy induces a Markov chain. And this Markov chain is exactly the join process of frequency and rewards. So together, Q comma S evolves as a Markov chain. Great. So let's see some examples of um, experiments that are under this category of sequentially randomized Markov experiments. One of the most interesting is actually Thompson sampling. So if you run Thompson sampling with a Gaussian prior and uh, likelihood function, namely conjugate prior, then it requires only the cumulative reward and action frequencies to compute and update the posterior. So it runs perfectly under this framework. And by the same token, a version of Thompson sampling uh, called exploration sampling for the best arm identification problem uh, also falls under this category by, uh, by the same reason. There's also a class of behavioral uh, heuristics that's often used in behavioral economics or uh, reinforcement learning in the psychology literature, uh, posits that, that agents sometimes behave by selecting actions that has so far led to good rewards in the past. And one version is called a Lewis's rule, and it simply posits that we're probably going to sample actions that's proportional to the cumulative reward this action has generated. So obviously, it also falls under this category. And also, you can consider more sophisticated variants of such heuristics, such as temper greedy, where you kind of sample the action proportional to some notion of uh, empirical mean reward, uh, things like that. Now, expert three and UCB are both pretty popular, as you know, uh, heuristics in this literature. They do not directly fit on, under uh, this framework because their sampling actually has a discrete um, jump in the sampling probability as your history evolves. Namely, you can write them using Q and S, but we actually require some kind of a regularity con conditions on the smoothness of the sampling function. So they do not apply directly, but it should work under suitable smoothing and modification as well. Okay, so these are the examples uh, that we have in mind and point is this actually is quite useful and captures lots of very rich algorithms. All right, any questions so far? I'm pretty much done with the setup. So I'm gonna go into the main results after this. All right, okay, cool. So the main results. So the first result I'm gonna show you is that under the correct scaling, the system I just mentioned before converges to a meaningful limiting object. And I'll hopefully convince you the object is simple enough and interesting and we can analyze it. So let's look at the convergence. So for now, I'm gonna fix the following parameters, number arms K, the vector of scaled mean reward mu, and the vector of standard deviations sigma. And then I will consider a sequence of Markov experiments with a suitably uh, convergent sampling function so that the action of the agent doesn't go crazy in the limit as n goes to infinity. Now, let me consider the following scaled state process. For fre the frequency q, I'm gonna scale by one over n so that qn is essentially the fraction of time I've been pulling a certain arm as a fraction of the entire horizon. For the reward, I'm gonna scale it differently. I will look at accumulated reward and divide by root n. This gives me a scaled reward. And for those of you familiar with diffusion approximation, this one over root n scaling is exactly what you expect from a central limit theorem and n being the sample size. All right, with that being placed, I then have to shrink time a little bit so that the process that takes place over one through n now takes place over zero to one, a unit interval. Okay. Similarly for, for the reward. So after the scaling in space and after the scaling in time, we're now ready to say the main theorem. So suppose that the system starts at state zero, zero, no action, no, no, no cumulative reward uh, at time zero. 
Then as n tends to infinity, the scaled process, now a process living on uh, time from zero to one, converges weakly to the unique solution of a set of stochastic differential equations. And this set of SDEs actually are pretty simple. And let me interpret for you. So it has a following form. The frequency Q evolves as a ordinary differential equation, simply dQ equals a drift times dt. Now the drift itself actually is a function of Q and S together. And particularly, uh, it's exactly the sampling function. Now the reward actually has a more sophisticated form. So the reward is a diffusion process. So the reward has a diffusion, uh, a drift term of sampling probability times mean reward. This is the mean drift of the reward plus the diffusion term, which is root pi k times sigma k d b k. And here's b k is a driving Brownian motion. So. Reward process diffusion, and this diffusion process drives uh, psi k, which then drives qk in the in in in, in, in a um, smooth way as an ODE and it kind of feeds back and so on. So that's that's the form of this diffusion process. Furthermore, not only do we know that the processes converge, uh, any kind of a bounded functional of the process also converge, and this is actually important for us because ultimately we probably care about some cost function about the sample path of Q and S, such as regret. Uh, and this is good to know that the, the costs also converge, not just the, regret, uh, not just the uh, sampling frequencies and rewards. Okay. Great. Another very interesting theorem I wanna show you uh, is a alternative way of stating what I just showed you earlier. So it's called the random time change theorem. Basically the same theorem uh, can be stated um, by a set of just ordinary differential equation but it's driven by a Brownian motion through a random time change. So here's the form. So the same SDE that you saw earlier can be written as follows. Well, first, now the cumulative regret is simply can be written as a function. Well, of what? Of the times that you pull the particular arm. So the, uh, the reward from arm K is simply uh, QK frequency times mu K expected uh, reward plus a noise term. And now this noise term is Sigma K times a Brownian motion WK, but the Brownian motion is observed at a random time. And this random time is exactly QK itself. So it's, it's a, you follow a Brownian motion until a time QK and you see how much you have gone and that's WK. And the uh, sampling frequency QK is um, again, AOD just like before. And this is the same as, as earlier. So this form of diffusion is actually particularly useful for both getting some insight on what's happening because the Brownian motion is literally pushing the, the reward. And also uh, it will show up in our analysis. And we, we use this a lot in, in uh, deriving um, kind of uh, bounds and insights about, about the threat. Great. All right, so those two theorems I just showed you, there are the general results that will apply to any kind of Markov, uh, sequentially randomized Markov experiments, uh, as long as the sampling functions have some kind of appropriate smoothness. So in what follows, I will then specialize these results in the particular context of Thompson sample. And I will show you two kinds of results. First, we probably want to have a, some understanding of the regret of Thompson sampling. And I will show you a set of results that give a more refined understanding of regret behavior than earlier, uh, than previously known. And the second set of results kind of look at the sample path distribution. And that's another benefits um, of this type of tool that gives you kind of an interesting uh, angle understanding the distributional properties of sample path of Thompson sampling. So let's dive into the very first one on, on the regret of Thompson sampling. Jing, just so that I'm aware of time, how much uh, time do we have? Um, you have about 30 minutes. 30 minutes, fantastic. All right. So on the regret. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to begin by explaining the theory in the very simple example of so-called one-armed uh, sequential experiment or one-armed Thompson sampling. And then I will talk about the generalization into two arms and uh, hopefully in the future into K arms as well. So what is a one-armed bandit or Thompson sampling? So here, essentially, the agent has two options, not exactly one arm, but one uncertain arm. So at every single step, the agent has two options. 
either to draw reward from a unknown distribution, um, PN with unknown mean and known variance sigma, or do nothing and receive a kind of a, a outside option, which uh, it knows to be just zero. So either do something, which is unknown, or do nothing, which gets reward zero. And the diffusion regime here corresponds to the case where the unknown arm has mean mu n, which scales as mu divided by root n, and sigma n, which is just always constant at being equal to sigma. Okay, so settings clear. So you can imagine the unknown arm is some kind of a new drug that you have no idea what the effect is relative to the standard treatment. And you would like to kind of a, give the drug and, and sort of maximize the, the payoff of the patient, uh, of the sequence of patients. Uh, if the drug is great, you probably want it to give to a lot of people. If the drug is terrible, you probably want it to shut it down as quickly as possible. So that's the one arm um, bandit problem. All right, so if we apply Thompson sampling um, to this problem, um, then uh, here's what we expect. So first of all, what is Thompson sampling? Just to briefly recap uh, what it is, Thompson sampling was actually developed as a Bayesian heuristic uh, back in the 1930s by Thompson. It was a very short uh, description in the paper. And the rationale being that the Asian essentially assumes that the problem instance is drawn from some prior distribution. And in each step, the agent used past data to update the posterior on the parameter of the problem, but then randomly samples action AI according to the posterior of the best action um, given the data available. So it's a little strange because we're actually not dealing with a Bayesian problem, we're dealing with a frequentist problem, but it's a very intuitive policy. You pretend the world is Bayesian and see what happens. And it has seen tremendous success in recent years uh, since it was uh, revitalized in the, uh, in the 2010s by, by uh, a group of Yahoo researchers. Okay. So if we were to apply Thompson sampling to this case, here's what we might do. We'll assume that the variance of the unknown arm sigma is known. And the agent uses a Gaussian prior with a mean mu n, uh, 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 sorry, a Gaussian prior on the unknown mean mu n. And this particular prior has mean zero because I don't know if the arm is good or bad and prior variance nu n. Now nu n is a very interesting quantity because it's part of the policy. It's something that I design as a policy designer. If mu n is big, it sort of means like I, I don't have much prior knowledge but mu is small, I, I have more prior knowledge on the range of, of, uh, of, uh, of the mu mu n. Okay, so one very interesting question as far as a design of a policy is concerned is what is a good policy? And specifically, what is a good choice for the prior variance mu n? So to understand that, let me define one notation, C, which is as n gets large, how big is the prior variance mu n relative to you know, kind of one over n scale. All right, so let me offer you two options. And these two are both uh, fairly used in practice. So one is called a smooth Thompson sampling. So here I'm gonna set the prior variance to the same scale as the, the mean. So the mean is going down to zero at one over root n. So that actually translates into the prior variance on the, on the scale one over n, or the prior standard deviation on the scale one over root n, namely, in the limit, I guess some kind of C that's strictly positive, that kind of regular I write as a problem, right? And number two is called undersmooth. So here, I would actually have a prior variance that decays to zero very slowly compared to the scale of the mean. Therefore, in the limit, C is actually equal to zero, meaning my prior variance is very, very big compared to the, the range of, of the means. Uh, it's so big that it becomes actually not even the same order. So now, um, who thinks number one is better? And assuming those who don't think number one is better thinks number two is better. Anyone want to take a guess? All right, Siva, what do you think? I have to ask some students for <laughs> code loss. Why are you picking on me? <laughs> I don't know, I have no clue. Maybe I'll go with one is better. <laughs> okay, you think one is better. A anybody else? All right, okay. Well, we're all very tolerant here. Could be one, could be two, right. All right, so yeah, so it's, it's like not so obvious, I guess. So one, one is sort of, if you were a Bayesian person, you probably think one is reasonable because if you were Bayesian, your prior variance should probably reflect 
the range of parameters of your parameter, right? So if your parameter is on that scale, you probably want prior to scale. And number two is, uh, is more like, it's not a very confident Bayesian person. It's a person that says, I'm Bayesian, but actually, never mind. I don't have any prior. Let's just believe anything, right? So the variance is really, really big for the prior. All right, cool. So I have no idea. So we ran some um, a numerical tests. So this picture actually came from running the diffusion limit of Thompson sampling applied to the setting. So let me explain. Um, there are two lines here, actually, but they, they converge, which is great. Uh, one is the actual simulation, and one is the diffusion um, uh, trajectory of the diffusion process. And they're virtually the same, which is great. So it's one line. Now, on the left side, we actually have a uh, regular rise or smooth problem. So here is case number one is on the left side. And case number two is on the right-hand side. And that's when the prior variance is huge. Actually, it stays just at one. It doesn't even scale. Now, on the top row is when the, the drug, the unknown drug, is great. So mu is positive on the top. And the bottom row is mu is not great. It's basically minus 10. Okay. So on the top, both perform very well. Ma namely, after some time, um, people are getting a lot of this kind of unknown drug because it's a great drug. On the bottom row, both start to shut down the better drug. But as you can see, the difference is stark, very stark. The smooth version shuts down the drug slowly and still suffers a fairly significant regret, whereas the under smooth version shuts down the drug very quickly, um, aggressively, and has a much smaller regret. Okay? So that's one numerical evidence, of course, a bit anecdotal for now. So another more interesting evidence here, I'm actually doing a more thorough simulation um, and numerical calculation. On the left-hand side, I'm showing the regret of Thompson sampling as a function of the arm quality, mu, minus meaning a bad drug, positive meaning a good drug. So as you can see, when the drug, uh, when the mu is positive, then across different shades of C, so each line represents a different C, the black line being C equal to zero and the colorful lines being C greater than zero, they're all doing pretty okay. As, as mu gets large, the regret is small. But very interestingly, on the left-hand side, as, regret, uh, as the mu gets large on the negative side, then almost everything seemed to blow up, except for when C is very small. And one take home message from this chart is that if you set C equal to zero, namely under smoothing with a huge prior variance, then it always does fairly well, both to the left and to the right. And in fact, to the left, it does almost optimally. And on the right hand side of this chart, I'm just showing you like a, a plot of the sampling probability. Um, and here the main message is that you observe this kind of subtle bias that uh, when mu is above zero versus one mu is below zero, there's an asymmetry. They're not exactly symmetric around zero. And that's just like a nice thing to know. As in fact, we know that in, um, um, in adaptive experiments, they're often this kind of like sampling bias induced by adaptation. So you, you don't have the same kind of symmetry around, around zero. All right, but either way, the plots have shown that it seems to be under smooth sampling and provides far better regret than the smooth version. Uh, and especially when mu is less than zero. And just to highlight all the plots are done using the diffusion limit, which is a nice tool already that can, can show us interesting things uh, by new, using the numerics. But we are gonna actually go one step further and prove this formally and confirm that not only is this true for the plot I show you in the in like a limited window, but it's actually true for all large mu that under smooth Thompson sampling is better. And we'll do so using the diffusion limit, as well as this regime, so-called uh, super diffuse limit uh, regime, which is a limit where we first take a diffusion limit as n goes to infinity. Then we look at the regime where the arm mu reward gets large. Okay. And then, so here's a result. So let R be the limit regret under diffusion. Then almost surely the following is true. If C is bigger than zero, namely I'm applying smooth Thompson sampling, then when uh, mu goes to negative infinity, I actually converge to a regret that's strictly positive. It does not go down to zero. Whereas if mu goes to positive infinity, uh, the regret eventually goes to zero at the rate of roughly one over mu. 
However, if I use a under smooth Thompson sampling with a diffuser prior, where prior is huge, then in both regimes, my regret goes to zero at rate one over V. So that's pretty cool. And the proof exploits uh, the random time change theorem that I showed you earlier, as well as a bunch of properties that's very intrinsic to Brownian motion, such as the law of iterative logarithm. So kind of the analysis um, in some sense showcases the convenience of having this type of very clean limiting object. All right, and it turns out um, this was actually sort of a, a warm up example. Uh, a very important sort of the real bandit uh, problem it starts at two arms. So it turns out the same result can be generalized to a two armed bandit. Now we have two arms and both arms are genuinely uncertain. You don't know which one uh, is which. And the mean rewards here using standard notation differ by delta divided by the scaling factor one over root n. So delta is often referred to as the arm gap or reward gap in the bandit literature. And here we get the same result. Namely, there's a version of undersmoothed two arm Thompson sampling algorithm with c equal to zero, under which as this arm gap between the best arm and the second best arm grows to, uh, um, sorry, this is actually a typo, as arm gap grows to infinity, then my reward goes to zero at rate one over delta. Okay, great. And here's again a plot for now the two arm Thompson sampling problem. And notice I don't have the minus and plus side because now it's just a reward gap between the good arm and the bad arm. And as you can see the, the, um, the results actually kind of shocking that C equal to zero is almost uniformly optimal in this case. It's, it's super, super good. So in some sense, the, the one arm example doesn't quite capture the, the true complexity of the bandit problem. Um, and only the one side of it does capture that. All right, so to put this result in perspective, what have we learned so far? So using diffusion analysis, we've learned that turns out in Thompson sampling, under smoothing leads to far superior regret when the arm gap is relatively large. Okay. And diffusion limit actually uh, reveals the root cause why this is happening. It's because under smooth Thompson sampling, a smooth Thompson sampling does not shut down a bad arm fast enough. The smoothing actually encouraged the algorithm to explore and turns out it's exploring a bit too much. Whereas under smooth Thompson sampling does do that while exploring just enough to sort of identify the better option. Okay. Now, um, to look at the, the more like refined scaling of this regret bound is also interesting. So from prior work by Menor Cyclis in 2004, we note that there is an instant dependent lower bound showing that for bandit problems with arm gap delta, that the best regret uh, you can hope in our regime is on the order of one over delta. Okay. So this is actually the first time, as far as we know, that Thompson sampling is shown to achieve near optimal finite time instant dependent regret, meaning for every single delta, for all large delta, um, it's kind of optimal on the, on the, on the instant by instant, uh, instant uh, cases. Now, there are algorithms known to achieve the same instant dependent uh, regret, uh, lower bound. Uh, however, it's kind of surprising to us that Thompson sampling, such a simple, almost naive heuristic, achieved the same guarantee as compared to uh, the other more crafted and somewhat more sophisticated algorithms, such as the improved UCB with arm dropping and elimination procedures. Whereas Thompson sampling is not even designed to do any of that. It just, just does this very naive thing. So that's really interesting. And however, it only does so if you use the correct under smoothing. Um, so going along this line, the last slide I wanna show you for the regret analysis is the following plot, which I found pretty interesting. So I've shown you at, at least asymptotically this kind of super diffuse analysis shows under smooth Thompson sampling has very, very nice um, delay properties, uh, delay <laughs> regret properties. But the diffusion limit, even without taking such analysis, already gives a very interesting tool for deriving very refined understanding of the regret behavior for Thompson sampling and for any other algorithm, actually. So here's a plot where I'm showing you uh, scale to regret as a function arm gap in the two arm Thompson sampling problem, where the red line is generated by solving the SDE. So this is, if you solve the SDE, this is the regret you obtain. 
Um, this is actually interesting because oftentimes it's very hard to actually get the regret of a algorithm for a particular instance. Let's say the gap is equal to two or something like that, but diffusion gives you that. So once you solve that, you can see the exact characterization Thompson sampling regret, and you can compare to, um, that to known bounds on other type of algorithms, the best bounds possible. So we actually combed the literature a little bit, and we found the following two bounds. And the other bounds are kind of infinite in some cases. There's improved UCB, and there's another uh, heuristic called explore then commit. So here you pull two arms for a bunch of times, then you commit to the better arm. And the time you pull them, it's actually optimized to the horizon. So this even assumes that you know the horizon and then you optimize to that. And what's very surprising to us, for example, uh, as far as we know, this is the first time you can see that Thompson sampling nearly outperforms uniformly the best known bounds of any kind that we know of. Uh, and we're pretty sure Thompson sampling is not the best algorithm, but still it's kind of interesting that the existing bounds clearly, the analysis wasn't able to really hit uh, to a level where, where we can actually be very competitive. So Thompson sampling actually outperforms both explain and commit and improve UC. And in fact, existing instant dependent regret upper bounds for Thompson sampling uh, do not even have a finite value uh, in, the, uh, in under the diffusion scaling. So it cannot even be plotted here. Now, the point of this plot is not to show that Thompson sampling is the best thing in the world. We, we, we absolutely should use it. It is actually very nice. We show that's really nice, um, but more just to show that this actually provides a tool for you to do such comparisons at the more uh, nuanced and refined level. All right. So that was a discussion about the regret behavior of Thompson sampling. Uh, in the remaining, I guess we have five minutes until Q&A. So I'll try to give a, a, another angle to, to this tool, which is the sample path behavior of Thompson sampling. I think with the diffusion, it's nice to get extra distributional information about how the algorithm performs. So again, before showing you the, the, uh, the theoretical results, um, the diffusion limit already allows to do some interesting simulation. So here I'm showing you the simulation of the diffusion process associated with one arm under smooth Thompson sampling. That's the version of Thompson sampling that we said it was really cool. And you see some pretty interesting behavior. Namely, even though we know the regret performs pretty well in the mean, the sample path is a bit violent. Okay, so here, I'm plotting the sampling probabilities of different runs of Thompson sampling. As you can see that either when mu is negative, which is a bad arm, or mu is a positive, which means the uncertain arm is a good arm, you can see there are sample path where the belief of Thompson sampling oscillates violently in the wrong direction. So here the arm is bad, but you, you can see the pink trajectory at some point believe the arm is almost 100% a good arm. And same way, here the arm is good. Most trajectories tend to believe it's good, but there are some trajectories that really is convinced early on that was a bad arm and sort of stuck to that belief. Okay. And the sim similar phenomenon happens uh, when you use the diffusion limits to analyze the regret of two arm Thompson sampling. So here I'm plotting you a distribution of regret uh, profile uh, using the, the, in the diffusion limit on two arm. As you can see, even when my um, uh, arm gap delta gets larger and larger, so most of the time a regret is very small, you see these bumps at two, four, six, and eight. And these are sort of the, the worst case regret you can hope for. So interestingly, we thought these were numerical errors. They're not. They're actually the sample path where the, the algorithm really made a wrong belief early on and sort of struggle to recover. So you see these pretty violent mistakes by Thompson sampling, okay? All right, so what does the theory say? So using diffusion limit, you can show the following type of result, which says under smooth and Thompson sampling, despite having a really nice mean regret performance, actually has a highly variable sample path. So when C is equal to zero, and regardless of the effect size of mu, uh, the quality of, of, of the uncertain arm, we know that with the one arm Thompson sampling, that if you look at the belief pi t, which is the sampling probability Thompson sampling, near zero. So this result says essentially it will be arbitrarily convinced that the wrong assumption is actually the true assumption okay? with arbitrary confidence. 
So it really has a, a lot of a violent behavior at zero as you get new data. It might just believe uh, because of the lack of smoothing that um, the, the regret is very, very good in, where in reality, the, regret, uh, the reward is actually very bad or vice versa. So Thompson sampling is all, almost always at some point arbitrarily convinced about mu having the wrong sign. So you can actually see that from the theoretical analysis as well. Okay. All right, so now to uh, a summary. So the first question, maybe just stepping back a little bit, why would we use diffusion asymptotics in these examples? Well, first of all, it actually leads to new insight, just like diffusion asymptotics in queuing theory oftentimes kind of lets some of the less important features of the problem uh, die away and kind of highlight um, using the words of uh, Kelly and Law, the kind of the important feature of the problems are kind of putting sharp relief once you have a, a fairly nice asymptotics. And not only the insights are there, but you can actually derive sharp instance specific characterization regret that was not possible before without the key. And in addition to that, you get distributional characterization, you get universal approximation so that the same result can hold even when your exact finite sample um, regret, uh, reward distribution um, are non-Gaussian or are, are beta Bernoulli. And so the diffusion approximation actually does not depend on minor features of the reward distribution. It's a great sanity check. It gives you kind of some kind of a, a, a nice idea about how things perform. And finally, we're very excited about this direction is hopefully this can power a host of inference algorithms. Once you have a good understanding of diffusion approximation, hopefully you can use that to derive powerful confidence interval bounds. Okay, so uh, in our ongoing and future work, uh, we're hopeful uh, to extend this framework into general k arm bandits inference, uh, as well as other algorithms beyond Thomson sampling uh, that's being used. Okay, so to sum up, we've advocated for a framework for analyzing adaptive sequential experiments using diffusion asymptotics. And this framework has allowed us to get fairly sharp predictions about Thomson sampling, either smooth or under smooth, leading to new insights. Um, in addition to the future work direction, uh, I actually wanna mention that since the initial posting of our paper, there's been some exciting work in this area as well. Uh, Fan Glynn considered a diffusion limit for Thomson sampling and a Hiranum Porter uh, used diffusion limits to design batch sequential experiments. And both works are independently uh, done from us um, but it's very nice to see that uh, um, similar tools are, are being used to understand sequential experiments. And I think that's quite an exciting area. Uh, one last thing, just maybe to kind of uh, put a plug in and kind of highlight something I'm very excited about personally. Um, I think for this community especially, um, there's a host of very powerful tools from stochastic modeling. And I think they offer new opportunities to model and analyze complex learning dynamics that without these tools would be very difficult. And some of our recent attempts in this domain are such as designing experiments uh, when you have test capacity constraints, such as in crowdsourcing or medical diagnostics. Uh, you can use mean field models to capture interference patterns in causal inference and get stronger results uh, than without modeling such interference. And you can see also you can use diffusion approximation and stochastic models to tackle these complex time dependencies in adaptive experiments such as in this work. So I think, I think this community can actually have a lot of contribution uh, when it comes to modeling and analyzing learning systems. And I just wanna highlight that that's something I think is really cool. All right, so that's all I have to say. And uh, thanks again for the opportunity and I'm ready for questions. Hey, Ash. Well, uh, nice, uh, very interesting work, nice talk. Uh, so my, so my, uh, question is basically coming from a place of not having caught up with the results. Uh, so you, so why, why is it that the, the under smooth case is, uh, gives a smaller regret intuitively? Uh, okay. So the intuitive reason under smooth case gives a smaller regret is because you trust the data quickly. So under smooth essentially means your prior has such a huge variance. It does not weigh heavily on your behavior early on in the process. And it turns out that's exactly what's needed to, to get small regret. You need to react to data quickly. You do pay a price. And the price you pay, unfortunately, is this more violent sort of a sampling behavior. Um, but eventually, on average, you always do recover, and it's worth it. 
I see. And and why is it that you trust the data more quickly? So maybe I don't maybe I don't have a proper understanding of what is under smoothed in the first place. Got so it. I thought, got it. So it has something to do with uh, the sequence, right? But for the end system, what is the meaning of under smooth? Yeah, so maybe let me just flash this slide one more time and maybe it wasn't super clear. So Thompson sampling works by updating the posterior of your model using existing data. It's a posterior in this case on the mean of, of the arms, right? So under smooth means my prior distribution for these means have a huge variance. Actually for, for practical matter, imagine the variance is infinite. So if I have a prior that has an infinite variance that essentially says, don't worry about the prior. Pretend I have no prior knowledge at all of right. where the, the mean should be. So that way, actually your prior factors very little into your update of the posterior, if that I, makes sense. I see, so you're holding sigma fixed and is that true or wrong? Yeah, you're, you're holding sigma fixed and yeah. you are essentially discounting the fact that you believe the prior is near zero. You don't even believe that anymore. You're like, whatever. I have no idea where the where the, where the mean is. Okay, good, good. Uh, my confusion was that I was thinking of it as being an assumption on the, the variance uh, sigma, but it's a, an assumption on the prior. So now I get it. Exactly. It's a ver assumption on the, it's the variance on the mean. Sorry, it's a little confusing. It's a prior variance on the mean, whereas the sigma is just known and it's fixed throughout. Got it. Thank you. And by the way, maybe let me highlight we're not the first to discover that uninformed prior works well. This is very well known in practice and in the literature, but probably one of the first to give this type of very precise uh, analysis of why it does well. Right. Um, so maybe it's like uh, Thompson sampling takes on a little flavor of UCB kind of a thing. And uh, so the, that blend works well. Uh, the, the what? So in the case of an uninformed prior, yep. so my, intuition now based on what you've been explaining is that maybe uh, Thompson sampling takes on a little bit of a UCB type of flavor, meaning that it's it's like uh, it's not zeroing in on, on an arm too quickly and, and it takes a while, it, it explores and then uh, then the good. Actually, it's almost the opposite. So you actually oh, yeah. want it to zero in on the arm very quickly, but not, not too quickly, you're right. But it's like more quickly than you would have gotten if you had a you know, smooth prior, but yeah, it's, I, I cannot definitively say what the connection is to UCB in this case, but yeah, it seems to work pretty well. Thank you. I have a question. Sure, Siva. Um, I'm struggling to um, understand the motivation behind the scaling regime. Can you explain? I probably missed it. Can you explain that? Again? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, that's a very, very good point. Um, let me maybe emphasize a bit. The, okay, so here's the scaling regime. Okay, so maybe let me, let me motivate a little bit uh, the scaling regime. So when you consider in general, bend the type of problems, you can imagine there are three regimes, okay? So there's a one regime where the rewards are super different and the samples are very abundant. So in those regimes, after a few samples, you kind of figure out which arm is better and you pull those good arms, okay? So that's so-called the fixed design regime. It's like the Robin Lie regime, you get log and regret. Great. There's another regime, which is what I call the trivial regime, where your, re your rewards are so similar that it really doesn't matter what you pull. Let's say all the arms have exactly the same rewards, okay? And there, it doesn't matter what you do, you're fine. Now, the sort of arguably the most challenging and damaging regime where a good algorithm, bad algorithm perform very differently is the regime where the rewards are sort of similar, but not so similar. It's hard to tell. And yet, if you don't tell them apart, you suffer a lot. And that's exactly this regime. It's a regime where the rewards are differentiated, but at the scale of one over root n. And in fact, this is again, uh, something that's well known in the banded literature. Almost all the kind of a worst case uh, upper lower bounds are driven by this regime. So whenever you see a regret bound of root n, that's exactly the regime. What we do here is actually take that regime, but impose a well-defined scaling to it. Mm -hmm. So you, you fix the direction of scaling and you scale down. And that way actually gives exactly the kind of the, the nuance of that regime in particular. If that I makes sense. Got it. Thanks. Um, a follow-up question. So you talked about lower bound by menor and scalars. Is that for this specific regime or is that a universal lower bound? That's a universal lower bound. So the uh, menor lower bound applies to any N and any uh, delta. 
But if you plug in the delta n for this regime, you get exactly what I showed you earlier, which is one over delta. So I have uh, uh, two questions. One is a um, clarification question. So in your analysis, you, you normalize the time horizon to like the time to be from zero to one. Does it matter I have the upper bound at one or any compact time interval, let's say? Any, any compact, it could be two, <laughs> 10, <Okay. laughs> yeah, indeed. All right, let's see. So that, that doesn't matter. Uh, so the other question is, since you have the diffusion um, limit characterized, I guess, can you define some notion of what is optimal and then try to design a policy that achieve that optimality? Fantastic question. So that's something we're thinking about. Uh, one subtlety here is actually, so the first reaction uh, people might have is, oh, great, so you can optimize, right? Maybe you can run some kind of optimal control. And it turns out for this particular problem, it's a bit more subtle. It's not about designing optimal control for a specific instance because the control policy is trivial. For any instance, the optimal control policy is pull the best arm all the time, right? It's actually a, a, a trivial control problem. What is not trivial here, what you're really dealing with is actually a dynamic game. It's you're actually trying to uh, play a minimax game where you are having a policy and the this rate chooses the mu. So you want to design policy that has in some sense the, the, the best minimax performance. Uh, and indeed, you're absolutely right. So I think it will be interesting to think about what does it mean to optimize? Now that you have this characterization, if you can define, okay, my adversary can choose a set of mu's in some compact set, and I'm designing a drift function that sort of achieves some good performance. So yeah, so that's a very interesting direction that uh, I think could be, could be quite interesting uh, to explore. Um, so my last question is about the, uh, so the last part you showed that for, for Thompson sampling, mm -hmm you actually have some trajectories where you can behave really badly at the beginning and that sort of give you this tail. Um, yep. So I guess, is there any way that uh, you would suggest to fix that problem? Can we actually get rid of that, those bad trajectories? Uh, fantastic question. I have no idea. Uh, part of me feels maybe that's a fundamental trade-off. Namely, if you want to adapt quickly to data, there's always the chance that you adapt to the wrong data or your data was wrong. So it might be a very interesting necessary evil that we don't quite understand yet. So my conjecture could be something like, if you want to get the optimal regret, you're, you're trading off the volatility of your, of your sampling process. So one, one uh, analogy I thought might be interesting, we were brainstorming and mentioning in the paper, is that you can think of Thompson sampling as a naive model of how the research community explores the nature of the world. It's sort of like hoarding. So the posterior distribution of Thompson sampling is essentially the fraction of researchers believing certain uh, hypotheses to be true. So then that says the, the community at large must have a fraction of people at any time believing completely the wrong thing if the community were to move fast towards the truth. So it's a necessary sacrifice. <laughs> um, so it, yeah, it's kind of interesting to think like that's actually a, it's actually a pretty good analogy because then it's like a group of people, uh, individuals have different beliefs and they all believe their world is correct. So, so that's what you will see uh, uh, manifesting. So yeah. Thank you. Um, sorry, Kuang, I have a question. Um, sure. And maybe because I did not understand you correctly, but so is the punchline that unsmooth um, Thompson sampling is better uh, than the smooth version. But if that's the upshot from your talk, uh, then doesn't it crucially rely on the fact that we are taking, we are looking at diffusion asymptotics mm -hmm. and we're taking n to be infinity. Um, right, so, okay, the, 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 let me unpack your question. I think there are a lot of uh, questions here. So first, um, the diffusion asymptotics work pretty well with reasonably large n. So it's not like you have to go crazy on n, for one. The, the second is that I, I do think uh, sort of the implied assumption of looking at a diffusion asymptotic is that this diffusion regime is important, meaning we are interested in designing algorithms that perform very well for this particular regime. Now, I have not argued that 
how well would this do, uh, this algorithm do? In those other two regime I, I, I talked about when Siva asked the question, right? For example, in the fixed design regime or in the, in the trivial regime. Uh, personal hunch, and, and maybe just based on the literature that we've seen so far, the fixed design regime, um, this might not be, uh, in fact, um, people have shown uh, uh, that um, Thompson sampling actually does very well in the fixed design regime, but this is not captured by the diffusion. However, it might also ar be argued that many other things also do very well. Uh, in fact, they do in the fixed design regime. So I would say maybe it's a bit easier to design good things for the, for the regime where the signals are super, super strong. Now for the trivial regime, if you don't care, whatever, it, anything works, right? So in some sense, yes, I would argue that um, it's important to look at this kind of scaling where the re rewards are kind of close to each other. And now that if we accept that that's the, the regime we're in, then yes, I would say that's exactly the insight that the upshot is that under smooth Thompson sampling performs very well uh, in this regime compared to the smooth version, which is kind of interesting because it kind of goes counter to the Bayesian intuition. So that suggests that Thompson sampling works well, but not because why, why we thought it worked well in the, in the first place. It's not that because it matches some kind of Bayesian intuition per se. In fact, it, you should not match a Bayesian intuition because you should not use sort of a, a, a very well fine-tuned prior uh, variance uh, there. Does that answer your question to a certain degree? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, another follow-up question. So with this diffusion scaling, um, I have a bit of difficulty like coming up with real examples because it appears a bit unnatural for the means to be scaling with the sample size. Um, I, I assume that this is not like a modeling, this is more of a modeling um, assumption and not like a description. Yeah, so that's a fair question. So I would say, again, every time you take the limit uh, in practice, you don't take that literally. You don't take, you don't imagine a system that actually goes to enter infinity. I think the best way I can describe to you is the limit describes the behavior of a system in which the signal strength, namely the, the difference in the rewards, are relatively small compared to the size of the sample size. That's all. So it's an it's a, it's a application where your uh, different options are somewhat similar and your sample size is not insanely large. And that's all. I think that's the best way to probably describe where such insights should apply. And that's exactly where. Mm. I see. Thank you very much. Cool. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Uh, so uh, you stated the process level convergence theorem, which is true for pretty much uh, a broad class of uh, uh, learning policies. But then uh, you use the process level convergence theorem pretty much to focus on Thomson sampling. So what are the challenges in studying other, uh, other learning algorithms? Um, not in particular. We, we just thought we should find something that everybody cares about. Okay. And I think by and large, if you have to pick one heuristic, um, Thomson sampling is one of the best to study. I think a natural question next is some version of UCB and exactly. uh, XP3 yeah. and so on. Absolutely. We just haven't gotten around to, to okay. analyze it. And Thompson sampling under conjugate prior has a very elegant uh, form. So it's kind of very nice to start with that. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, if there's no further questions, uh, let's thank the speaker again. And thank you all very much for being here. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the great talk. Siva, uh, do I just click on the end? Do I just uh, click on the end stream on YouTube, or I have to do something on, on Zoom as well? Uh, I think end stream on YouTube should do it. Okay. Because once we end uh, the meeting, the streaming will end. Okay. See you guys. See you, Kwong. Thank you. Bye. Bye.